Well, good morning, church. Uh, let's see. Oh, there we are. We're on. I don't have to project. That's great. Okay. They said earlier I might have to project. Yeah, I really appreciate Caleb. Last night I gave him a call. I was a little nervous about this message today, and I just wanted to make sure that we were hitting some of the things that were consistent with the themes that we've been talking about the last several weeks. And uh, what I really appreciate is that uh, at the end of our phone call, Caleb took the time to pray with me, and we prayed over this message. And so I do appreciate that. And then he started to quiz me about some things that he could say, you know, for an introduction. And I think he left out probably the most important thing, and I didn't really tell him this, but I was actually a, fo a founding member of Broad Fording's initial softball team. That's right. Yes. Back when we were too small to have our own team, so we played with another church for a while. And then we, we grew and, and we became a powerhouse. And uh, not really. I don't know. We, we, had, we had a good time. Um, but anyway, needless to say, I don't play anymore. My, my best years are behind me. I, I think my prime lasted about a year. So it was, it was fun, though. We had a good time doing all of that. And I know some of the guys are still playing, and some guys a little gray like me are still at it. I don't know how your bones handle it, because mine certainly can't anymore. So we've been talking a lot about relationships the last four weeks. During week one, Pastors were laying out the foundation for relationships for us, giving us a healthy relationship foundation. And then Pastor Bill talked about creating boundaries beyond that. And then Pastor Caleb talked about hospitality, he talked about circles and creating circles and how hospitality is actually a ministry that we can execute in order to expand our relationships and lead others to Christ and exemplify Christ in the lives of not only people we know, but people we don't necessarily know real well. And then previously, Pastor Wine talked about conflict resolution, the causes, our response, and the role of the Holy Spirit in conflict resolution and in, in resolving those conflicts. Today, we're going to talk about being ambassadors for Christ and being called to reconciliation and restoration. Think about that. We will define it. Reconciliation and restoration as ambassadors to Christ. We're going to divide. Yeah, let me try that again. We're going to dive into the profound calling we have as apprentices to Jesus Christ to engage in the ministry of reconciliation and restoration. And we're going to be drawing from God's word heavily and a little bit from Ken Sandy's work called The Peacemakers. We're going to explore what reconciliation and restoration mean as believers. We're going to talk about why reconciliation and restoration are imperative for us as followers of Christ. We're going to talk a little bit about the hard stuff. What are the obstacles that keep us from restoring relationships or reconciling with others? And then we're going to talk a little bit about how we can practically live out this calling in our daily lives. It's a very broad umbrella, as Pastor Caleb and I were discussing last night. We could probably break this down and have a sermon series on every element that we talk about here today. We're going to just try to give you a broad overview so that we understand that as believers, we are called to exemplify reconciliation and restoration in all of our relationships with our family, with our church, with God first and with our community. Let's bow for a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this privilege and this honor to be up here today. But Lord, I pray that you would anoint the words that I say. May they be a blessing to you. May they glorify you. But anoint the message so that those who are in attendance here and watching online hear what you want them to hear and graft into their hearts what you want them to use to be transformed into your image. Lord, I also want to say a brief prayer for Pastor Wine and his family as they, as they seek respite and rest. They've been dealing with some troubles. I pray your blessing upon them, your comfort upon them, and your strength. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So I want to take a moment to meditate on a, on a key verse. Romans 5.8. I want to take a look at this. Before we do, as you, as you can see it up there on your screen, or on the screen behind me. Sorry, I see it up there. You see it back behind me. Um, I had that trouble in softball too. Where's the ball? I, yeah, did the same thing. But I want to look at Romans 5.8. So let's take a, a deep breath for a second. Clear your mind. 
Get rid of the distractions and let's focus on what this verse says. Romans 5, 8. But God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. I want to let that sink in. It's the heart of the gospel. It's the good news. Let's say that again. Let's, in fact, can we read that together? Let's do that together. Ready? But God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Now what's even better is if you take out the objective pronouns and put in your personal pronoun, I, me, but God commendeth his love toward me that while I was yet a sinner, Christ died for me. Each and every one of you, the king, the master of the universe, the king of kings, the Lord of Lord, Lord over all the heavenly hosts and beyond anything we can imagine, before you even knew what love was, before you even knew how to be reconciled, God took that first step and sent his son to die for you to reconcile and restore us. We didn't even know we needed to be reconciled yet. But he took that step to reconcile us and restore us to him. We were created, this is the gospel in a nutshell, right? We were created for a perfect union and fellowship with God. But because of our sinful state, because of our rank and defiled nature, in our offensive and unholy condition, we were separated from God. We deserve to die. We deserve to be separated from him for all of eternity. And we deserve to be in hell for all of eternity. And that could be the end of the story, but it's not. God made the first move. He showed us what love was before we even understood the concept. He sought us out to reconcile us and to restore us to a right relationship with him. He paid the price through Jesus Christ. By his death and resurrection, he provided the only way to be reconciled and restored to fellowship with God. And because of his grace, his eternal, unfathomable grace and unspeakable love, his forgiveness is available to any of us who believe Jesus is the Son of God, God made flesh, and the moment you trust and the moment you believe there's a miracle that happens where the Holy Spirit comes in and dwells inside us, we become in the flesh the, holy, the, the temple of the Holy Spirit, the temple of God, and we are given Holy Spirit power to transform our lives, to become a new creation with the mind of Jesus Christ. And you're probably sitting there saying, wow, whoo. Sometimes I don't feel like I have that power, right? Because we still have that nature that we wrestle with. You know what the difference is? Once we become Christians, once we have that spirit, we, we start to recognize the difference. Oh, I'm not walking in the spirit. I'm walking in the flesh. Got to do something about that. Lord, I give that to you. Let me walk in the spirit to deal with the situation or this conflict or this relationship. And that's what we're going to talk about today. What does a transformed life look like in our relationships? If you remember one thing this morning, remember this. It is the nature and character of God to reconcile and restore, to mend, to heal, to make new, to renew to make perfect, to straighten what's bent, to straighten what's crooked, and to make right what's wrong. That's who he is. That's what he does. And as believers, we are image bearers of Christ. We are called to pursue that same nature and that same character in all our relationships. And this is hard. It's going to get tough today. It's a vertical relationship and it's a horizontal relationship. First, we need to be reconciled and restored to God. And hopefully we've taken care of that. If you haven't, make that decision today to trust in Jesus Christ. And once we have done that and we are reconciled to God, then we begin the process of reconciliation and restoration to everyone around us, to our church. That's what our job is as a church. Our, our family of believers come first. Our families come first. And then our communities 
Reconciliation and restoration should be the nature and character of our walk and our apprenticeship to Jesus Christ. You don't see a lot of that, though, on Facebook. You don't see a lot of that in the news cycle. That's not what our culture is about. Our culture is about revenge. Stick it to them. Sue, get them back. Hammer them. Complain about it on social media. That'll make me feel good. I get my 10 seconds of feeling better by dragging somebody who has no idea maybe they even wronged me into the public eye. That's not what Jesus would do. Let's define reconciliation. What is reconciliation? Reconciliation involves the mending of broken relationships. Transitioning from bitterness and separation or alienation or awkwardness into peace and unity. Reconciliation involves making amends and taking steps in order to repair a broken relationship. That is the heart of it, restoring and reconciling broken relationships. It involves moving from being bitter, being alienated, feeling awkward, thinking this relationship is, is lost, this person is too far gone, maybe I'm too far gone, into one of hope and trust and peace and unity. In fact, the Bible calls our churches to be an oasis of reconciliation. People should be able to come here and find reconciliation and restoration because we are exemplifying it in our relationships every day. Reconciliation is not about finding a compromise or splitting the difference. It's about pursuing genuine forgiveness and restoring a fractured relationship. And I will tell you that reconciliation takes time, it takes patience, it takes humility, and it takes transparency. So where do we get this? Let's go to God's word in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 17 through 20. We're going to read this and then we're going to unpack it because this is, this is vital to what, we talk, what we're talking about this morning with reconciliation and restoration. 2 Corinthians 5, 17 through 20 reads as follows. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old has gone, the new is here. The King James Version says, I love this, way, this phrasing. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. All this is from God, who reconciled us to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. Why is it so important that we understand this? Let's dig a little deeper and unpack what Paul is telling us in 2 Corinthians. We'll, we'll take it a few verses at a time. We'll look at verse 18. What is the source of reconciliation? The verse says, all this is from God. He is the author of reconciliation. He founded it. He invented it. It's what he is about. It is his character and his nature reconciling. And he reconciled us who didn't deserve it through Jesus Christ. God has taken the initiative as well. Keep that in mind. God, our father, has taken that first step. We didn't deserve it. He didn't wait on us to make the first move. He came to us to seek that reconciliation, to restore the broken relationship. He took that initiative and was purposeful in restoring and reconciling us. These are the qualities and characteristics of God. And we have been given this ministry. What does that mean? We'll get to that in a second. Verse 19, what is the message of reconciliation? What is that? That God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ. That's what people need to hear. That's the good news. That's the gospel. Not counting people's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. What a great responsibility. Jesus came. 
He ministered. Then he ascended to heaven. Now what? We have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. That ministry has been committed to us. The ministry of reconciliation involves proclaiming that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. The gospel message is one of God's gracious offer of forgiveness and restoration through grace, unearned, undeserved. Verse 20, he has committed the message of recon reconciliation to us. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors. Whew, let that sink in for a second. Nobody should ever walk through this life feeling worthless, having no purpose, having no meaning in life, wondering who you are, wondering what you're supposed to be doing. You are Christ's ambassador. You are his representative. And he has entrusted you and committed this ministry of reconciliation to each of us as believers, to us as a body, as a church. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. We have been given the ministry and the message of reconciliation as his official representatives. Believers are called to continue this work, this, the work of Christ, by appealing, appealing to others to be reconciled to God and then to reconcile with others. Wherever broken relationships and confused relationships, fractured relationships exist in our lives and those of our church brothers and sisters. This is our calling. Most importantly, we go back to verse 17 because here's where we need to understand something. In the flesh, this is not natural. In the flesh, this is very difficult. And we'll talk about some of the reasons why it's so difficult to do that. But verse 17 emphasizes that we don't do this alone. We have the power of the Holy Spirit to rely upon because as 17 says, we are new creatures made new by the indwelling of God in the form of the Holy Spirit. And if we walk in the Spirit, we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. Biblically, reconciliation first ref refers to mending our relationship with God through Christ. And then that serves as the foundation for our call to reconcile with one another. So you're thinking, okay, all right, I get it, man. You kind of made your point. I'm supposed to be reconciling. What about, you know, you talked about the church. What about the church? Let me tell you how important this is. Let's look at Matthew 5, 23 through 24. There's a message in Matthew 5, 23 to 24. It says this. Therefore, if you are offering your gift at the altar, worship team, a message, teaching in Sunday school, serving donuts and coffee, being a greeter, welcoming, coming just to worship. If you are coming here to, to offer your gift at the altar, and if you remember that your brother or sister has something against you, how important is it? Do we just go ahead and continue church and hope that it all just goes away? No, leave your gift there in front of the altar. First go and be reconciled to them and then come and offer your gift. It is imperative that broad fording, that the, the fellowship of believers be an oasis of reconciliation and restoration, transparency, forgiveness. We'll go into a little bit of detail later, but we are all called to be reconciled to others because Christ reconciled us to him. We're called to be reconciled with God, our families, our church, and our communities. So what about restoration? You've heard me mention that term as well. So let's define restoration as well. Because sometimes reconciliation and restoration can kind of be combined. It might be part of the same process that can occur. Sometimes they're a little bit different. Reconciliation might be when I recognize that I have wronged a brother or sister, and I confess and I examine myself and I realize, wow, I, I need to step out and say something to them. I really kind of blew it and I'm going to go, I'm going to repent of that and apologize and, and try to and make this right. And then restoration is what the other person does 
when they restore and rebuild trust, we re rebuild integrity and make that bond stronger than it was before the offense, that's restoration. But sometimes they're kind of used uh, interchangeably, but restoration usually follows reconciliation. So what is restoration? It's about bringing someone back to a state of wholeness and integrity. This is the hard part. It's tough. It involves healing and usually for both parties. It involves rebuilding trust. It involves helping someone who has wronged us to find their way back to righteousness and fellowship. This can be restoration personally, between me and another person, between you and another person, between you and a family member, between you and another brother or sister in the church. Or it could even be a little bit broader. It could be between the church and a believer, a brother or sister who has fallen away and in demonstrating qualities and characteristics that are not in keeping with what Scripture says. And we gently, gently approach them. Where do we, where do we understand that, that this happens? First of all, let's, let's keep in mind what happened with Peter. If you remember... Peter, uh, on the eve of Christ's crucifixion during the trial, Peter denied Christ three times. He had walked with Jesus Christ for three years, totally bought in, totally believed Jesus Christ as being the Son of God. But when confronted with the difficulty of his culture and, and the possibility of personal harm and, and damage to his reputation, he denied Jesus three times. When he realized what he had done and that Jesus had predicted that this would happen, he fell away ashamed, guilt-ridden, brokenhearted. But after Jesus rose again, he seeks out Peter and he restores him, asking, do you love me? Three times, stripping away the shame, stripping away the guilt, getting down to the bond that they had to the heart of the matter. This is the work of believers. This is the work of our church. Galatians 6, 1 to 2 says this. Brothers and sisters, if someone is caught in a sin, you who live by the Spirit should restore that person gently. And I chuckle because it doesn't mean we start carrying around big sticks, right? And we start chasing each other around. And I remember as the administrator, <laughs> oh my goodness, I would try to say this without laughing too hard because it's a serious matter. But as the administrator of Broadford and Christian Academy, we had a dress code. And that was really important to some people, probably more important than other things. And I remember as an administrator, you know, some people would admonish me and say, hey, you got to stick that, you got to stick them with that dress code, stick them with that dress. And I felt like sometimes I'm walking around the hall saying, is your shirt tucked in? Is your shirt tucked in? And yeah, those are the little things in life that are important. I get it. But I was kind of after the bigger picture, you know, but no, that's not what we're talking about. Brothers and sisters, if someone is caught in a sin, you who live by the Spirit should restore that person gently, speaking the truth in love. But watch yourselves, or you might also be tempted. Carry each other's burdens, and in this way, you will fulfill the law of Christ. This is a beautiful verse, because I want to tell you guys, you, you already know this, the Christian walk and living life in this earth, in the flesh, with the indwelling Holy Spirit, sometimes we are, we are walking on landmines, and it's not easy and sometimes we have doubts. Sometimes we, we might fall away. Sometimes we struggle. Maybe something happens in our lives and we need help. And that's why Christ created the body of believers. He created the church for us to lift each other up, to help each other on our walk. No one person in this auditorium today has it all figured out and does it all perfectly. Jesus did. And he's given all of us that Holy Spirit power to help each other. I used to think that uh, watch yourselves, you may also be tempted. I used to think that meant, ooh, yeah, if, so if I, if I go to somebody in love and I say, hey, uh, that, can we talk a little bit about what, what's happening here in, in your life? And maybe I used to think that that meant, well, I might do that too. Yeah, that's true. But you know what I think the bigger temptation is? The bigger temptation is to become sort of like the church lady and become self-righteous. Well, look at what you're doing. Right? That's not, that's not what this is talking about. But that is a temptation. We have to be very, very careful that when we do this, we approach in love and humility and we resist the temptation to feel that we are self-righteous. Because listen, folks, we're no better than that person. And there, but for the grace of God, go we. Right? 
So gentleness, humility, trust, and forgiveness. I want to spend a minute just to talk a little bit about forgiveness and, and talk about what Ken Sandy says forgiveness is because forgiveness is an essential component of restoration. And it's important that we understand a little bit about what forgiveness is. And Ken Sandy has done a lot of work in scripture to tease out a definition. So if we could define forgiveness, it, it goes like this. Forgiveness is a conscious decision rather than an emotional state. It's a decision. It is an act of the will where we choose to forgive someone regardless of how we feel at the moment. And oh, brother, don't we feel it in the moment. Somebody cuts you off in traffic. I'm not feeling too forgiving, right? Oh, I hope that guy gets nailed by the cops, you, you guy, right? But that's, that's not the Holy Spirit power that Christ is talking about. And listen, I'm going to stand before you and say I'm the first. I'll admit it. Ask my wife. I think just, it wasn't just the other day when my wife said, now, are you being very godly? Yeah. <laughs> So, you know, I, I have that reminder. That's what she's there for, right? She's, she's my helpmate. Forgiveness is a conscious decision. Think about Jesus on the cross when he was whipped and beaten to within an inch of his life. Scarred, battered, bruised, falling down, trying to carry that cross on his shoulders, needing assistance to get up to the hill of Calvary. And while they are nailing his hands and his feet to the cross, he says, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. Father, forgive them. What power. Ephesians 4.32 says, Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. Restoration and even reconciliation cannot be fully realized in our relationships, in our church, without forgiveness. Ken Sandy emphasizes that forgiveness has two dimensions. Vertically, we have to seek God's forgiveness. That's first. True repentance. I was wrong. I will turn away from this. I, I don't, I, I realize that was filth and garbage and I should not have done that. And we make it right with God. And then that gives us the power to help forgive others. Horizontally, then we extend that forgiveness to all others who have wronged us, reflecting God's grace to them. He goes a little bit more into detail. I'll just hit this real quick. A couple of promises about forgiveness. He says that forgiveness means that I will not dwell on this incident anymore. Doesn't mean we're going to forget it. We're not really capable. God can forget. We can't. And it's very difficult. If you say, well, I'll forgive and forget. Well, we don't really. But what it means is I will not dwell on this incident. Forgiveness involves a commitment not to brood over the offense or allow it to fester in our minds. A second characteristic of forgiveness is, um, is that it is, oh, I think, let me check my notes, make sure I got this right. Yep, I will not dwell. I will not bring up this incident again and use it against you. You can't be a scorekeeper. If you're a scorekeeper, that's not real forgiveness. I forgive you, honey. Do you remember in July 1987 when you said that? Yeah, oh, yeah, okay. Can't be a scorekeeper. True forgiveness is unconditional. The promise means that we refrain from weaponizing the past or we don't bring it up in future conflicts or conversations. It means that we will not talk to others about the incident. It's confidential. We don't spread the offense. We protect the offender's reputation. We prevent gossip. And we certainly don't post on Facebook about it. And finally, I will not let this incident stand between us or hinder our personal relationship. Forgiveness is very costly. It's not something you do on a whim. It's not an easy decision. And I'm going to tell you now, and even just in our conversation last night with Pastor Caleb, this has been on my heart. I know there are people who have suffered trauma, who have suffered abuse, who have been terribly hurt and injured and wounded. Forgiveness doesn't mean there are no consequences. Forgiveness doesn't mean there is no justice. Forgiveness doesn't mean that there isn't treatment. Forgiveness doesn't mean that it happens overnight. Sometimes it is a process. It involves a personal cost. We give up our right to get even. We give up our right to hold a grudge. And we give up our right to demand repayment for the wrong done to us. This mirrors the sacrificial nature of Christ's forgiveness of sin. Listen to that. The world doesn't do that. 
But we as a church, if we are walking in the spirit and this is what we do, this is what sets us apart. This is what makes us, as Deuteronomy says, a peculiar people. It's what makes us stand out. It's what makes us different. Wow. These Christians, they really are different. But if we engage in war, we're just like everybody else. Finally, forgiveness is a process. And that's what I want everybody to understand, especially those who have been harmed deeply and wounded egregiously. Forgiveness can be a process, particularly in cases of deep hurt or repeated offenses. It may involve ongoing prayer, reliance on God's grace, the support of others, sometimes even professional support, and repeated decisions to forgive. So I don't want to make light of that. Let me, let me just ask you this, too, or just bring this out too. This has been on my heart. I'm a, I'm a by nature, uh, fairly passionate guy. I, you wouldn't believe it, but by nature, I'm really more of an introvert. But sometimes when I get out in competitive environments, you know, I can kind of cut loose a little bit or I can, I can lose control. You know, I get, I get rowdy. And uh, John's laughing because he played softball with me. <laughs> and sometimes, and I know I've done this, sometimes we step on landmines and we hurt somebody else or we offend them, but we don't realize it. We just go about our day. Now, if you're married, you know exactly what I'm talking about, right? You come home, hey, how's it going? All right. Okay, what did I do? So this is where, if, if there's that tension, if, there is, if you harbor anything against somebody else, and, and it's, it's a, 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 a grievance where you feel like they need to make the move, don't rule out the possibility that they just don't know. They just don't know. And it would, if, if it would clear the air and strengthen the relationship, then say something. Now, you might need to get in line, but I invite you to say something to me if I have done that to you and stepped on any landmines because I seek reconciliation and restoration, honesty, transparency, brotherly and sisterly love, the church, family. And I want to exemplify that in my life and in our church's life. So what keeps us from our what, what keeps us from reconciling and restoring? Ooh, this is where it gets hard. Pride. Pride, man. Right? I'm not going to admit I didn't do anything wrong. You see what that guy did to me? I didn't do anything. Pride. Sometimes it's embarrassment, right? I'm just ashamed. I'm embarrassed. I, you know, to have to confront that, I don't want to have to look in the mirror. So it's just better to... Eh, just let it go. They'll be all right, you know, and, and they're too far gone. This whole, this whole conflict has gone too far. I, you know, I, I'm going to let it go. It'll, water under the bridge. No, that's not what Christ calls us to. And I'm not saying that to, to stick it to you. I'm saying it to me as well. That's not what Christ calls us to. Sometimes we're unwilling to apologize. In our culture, look around you, it's very easy to be the victim there's almost like a celebrity status in being a professional victim now, right? But that's not what Christ calls us to. He doesn't call us to be the victim. He doesn't call us to blame shift. What's another hindrance? What's another obstacle? Bitterness, anger, and unforgiveness. Sometimes we like to cultivate that anger and we harvest it and we water it and we make it our own and we give it a name and it's like a little pet. And we like living there in anger and in bitterness. But what we don't realize is that anger and bitterness is like a vine, like a boa constrictor vine. And as you harvest that and as you, as you allow that to fester, it starts to squeeze you. And it ruins your joy, ruins your fellowship with God, removes your access to that Holy Spirit power that resentment or that desire for revenge can, can impede our ability to reconcile and restore. A couple of other things, poor communication, failing to listen. Yes, dear, I will work on that. Failing to listen, being unwilling to be transparent with your feelings. I know that's, you know, for some of that's kind of hard. Oh, you're going to make us share our feelings now. 
No, I'm not. No, not openly. But if, hey, if you're led, so be it. If that's what it takes to reconcile. But really, we're talking about a confidential situation, one-on-one with somebody where reconciliation, restoration, maybe you and a couple of brothers or sisters, you're, you're trying to reconcile with some support and some help. And you're, you're letting it out. You're, you're, you're getting some things off your chest that need to be let out. Being transparent is important because we can't be honest here in our church. Where do you think we can be honest Where can we be vulnerable? Where can we be sincere about our trials and our tribulations, our triumphs and our failures? A lack of empathy empathy is a a hindrance as well when we're unwilling to see the other person's perspective or acknowledge how they feel. When I made reference to broad forwarding and and dress code, I I understand why that was an issue. Right? Because if you take care of those little things, the bigger things can sometimes take care of themselves. If you let little things go, bigger things can go. And then you have a bigger problem in the future. I understand that perspective. So I used the Pastor Wine's message on balance, and, and you try to balance things out. Unrealistic expectations. You can't approach reconciliation or restoration by setting unreasonable demands on somebody else or demanding that the other person change in unreasonable ways. Sometimes they need to change. Sometimes there has to be behavior or a habit that has to change. And that's where we get the help. That's where it's a process. That's where it might take a fellowship of believers. And there is a process for that in church doctrine and in Matthew. The other hindrance is this, and this is where we have to be really careful, folks. You know, social media opens the door to becoming a third party to conflict When others get involved in conflict that they have no business being in and we take sides, we are actually interfering with the reconciliation restoration process. Think about that. I don't want to get political here, but think about how we view people in different political parties and how sometimes we speak about them knowing that like us, they are in need of reconciling with God and if they don't, there is an unspeakable eternal tragedy and judgment awaiting them. That's far more serious than any silly stuff that happens here. And finally, unconfessed sin. Without true repentance, and that's the heart of it all, without true repentance, reconciliation and restoration are impossible because it means we are holding back on being reconciled with God. Once again, why are we called to this ministry? Because as new creations in Christ, we are entrusted with the message of reconciliation. This calling is not optional. It is essential and vital to our identity as Christians. By embodying reconciliation and allowing the Spirit to work in our lives, we reflect the very nature of God and His redemptive work in the world. Ken Sandy in The Peacemaker says this, Reconciliation and restoration are a reflection of God's character. God in his infinite mercy pursued peace with humanity through Christ and we in turn are called to pursue peace with others. The key to peace and reconciliation is understanding and practicing God's forgiveness. We forgive as we have been forgiven. When we make every effort to live at peace with others, we reflect the character of God and become his ambassadors of reconciliation in the world, thereby ultimately glorifying him. How do we do this? I'll give you a couple quick steps here. Uh, We don't have a lot of time to dwell on it, but I'll, I'll just, if you're taking a note, I'll send you my notes. But if you're taking notes, here we go. Number one, acknowledge and confess. Examine yourself and ask God to reveal the areas of brokenness in your relationships. Confess your part in any conflict and seek forgiveness. James 5.16 says, confess your sins to each other, pray for each other so that you may be healed. So we acknowledge and confess, examine yourself, look for where those areas of brokenness in our relationships. Number two, initiate forgiveness. Remember, God didn't wait on us. Initiate forgiveness. Forgiveness is a proactive choice. Jesus teaches us in Matthew 6.14 and 15 that forgiving is essential in order for we ourselves to be forgiven. Approach those you are in conflict with, with grace, just as God has extended grace to you. Number three, communicate honestly and lovingly. 
Effective reconciliation involves honest and loving communication. Speak the love, speak the truth in love. is what Ephesians 4.15 tells us. Fourth thing, seek mediation and help if needed. Sometimes reconciliation requires outside help. Sometimes you need counsel. When you take a believer into counsel with you, that's done in confidence. And again, there's a Matthew 18 principle that talks a little bit about how to arbitrate conflict and, and a need for reconciliation and restoration. There's a process for resolving those conflicts. Seek mediation and help if needed. Number five, commit to rebuilding trust. Reconciliation is not a one-time event, but it's a continuous process of rebuilding trust. Be patient, be persistent in demonstrating love and integrity in your relationships. And finally, and again, the crux of it all, pray for reconciliation. Prayer is crucial. Pray for the strength to forgive. Pray for the humility to seek forgiveness if that's what needed is needed. And pray for the grace to pursue peace. Philippians 4, 6, and 7 reminds us to present our request to God and who, who will grant us peace that transcends understanding. I'm going to call the worship team back up here as we wrap this up today. The ministry of reconciliation and restoration is a divine calling that reflects God's redemptive work in our lives first. And then it is manifested in all of our relationships with others, to the church, to our families, and in our community, setting us apart. Some of you might have heard the story and seen the movie. There's a book out called Unbroken. Then there was a movie about a guy named Louis Zamperini. Louis Zamperini was an Olympic runner in 1936. Now, he didn't finish real high, but the fact that he made Olympics against all odds, it, like he was, he was the underdog. And he made it, and he performed in the Olympics. But in World War II, he became a B-24 bomber. He was, a, he was in, the, in a gun crew in a, on the B-24. And as they were on a mission over the Pacific in 1943, his bomber was shot down over the Pacific Ocean. He among a couple, and, and a couple other crew members survived being shot down. But you know what? In that case, survival might have been worse than death. They survived for 47 days in a raft floating in, in the Pacific Ocean. 47 days trying to find water to drink, trying to find food to eat. I believe one of his, one of his crew died in that raft. They were finally captured by the Japanese after 47 days. So it got worse. After 47 days of enduring that, they were captured and taken to Japan to a POW camp. And when the Japanese realized that he was an Olympian, he became a symbol of the champion American. And they knew if they could break him, if they could break him in front of the other prisoners, boy, that would just break the morale and the spirit. And they, they took great delight in torturing him in beating him, in abusing him, humiliating him, in bullying him, singling him out with severe physical, emotional, and mental cruelty beyond description. His experience left him deeply scarred, and he was consumed by hatred for his Japanese captors. He wanted nothing more than to get back at them. When the war was over and he returned home, his life was plagued with PTSD. Nightmares, alcoholism, trauma, uncontrollable rage, and a marriage on the brink of extinction. And then, he accepted Christ. He was changed. He went to a Billy Graham crusade, he accepted Jesus Christ. And by pursuing life in the spirit, his life was transformed. Louis Zamperini <laughs> flew back to Japan and met with his captors, each Japanese captor, to say, I forgive you. I forgive you. And I want to tell you about the reconciliation that's most important of all. There was only one that he could not meet with. It was the most brutal guard. He was nicknamed the bird. The bird held on to pride, held on to bitterness, and held on to anger and refused to meet with Louis Zamperini, but that was okay. 
he met with all the others and went back to preach the gospel and to reconcile and restore. I pray that our church brings glory to God by our willingness to answer the call to tell others about the need to be reconciled with God and our willingness to always pursue reconciliation and restoration across relationships. Let's pray.